Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Saul, uh, the Commercial Director at Synaptic. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining. Um, we'll be probably giving everyone a couple of minutes to join the webinar today. I can see a few of you are coming on stream now and there's probably a few more uh, going to be joining us in the next few minutes. So if you uh, wouldn't mind being patient with us, we'll just give everyone a, a little time to sign up. Um, while we're doing that, uh, a few housekeeping notes for everyone listening in so you know what's going to happen today. Um, you'll find that uh, in common with a lot of other webinars that you'll, you'll join, uh, this audience is muted. Um, that's just to allow uh, good kind of transmission quality for the speakers and they will be uh, starting up in a moment. However, we've made sure that the Q&A button um, is available to you so that if uh, what we're saying raises questions, uh, please don't use the chat. Uh, that's not enabled for this meeting, but the Q&A button is the one to use and our engineers, um, Lloyd and the team are there to answer any questions you have. And we'll try and do that live if possible, um, you know, depending on how complex the question is. Uh, and if you're happy for us to get back in touch with you after the event for more complex or specific questions, which are confidential or you know unique to your business, then uh, do let us know in the, in the uh, Q&A and we'll do our best to follow up with you afterwards. I can see quite a few people are joining now and I, I won't keep everyone waiting too long, but we'll give it uh, uh, a minute uh, because people are still coming on. Uh, so to explain uh, this for everyone again, um, this is the second webinar that we've hosted. Uh, the first one was actually hosted for us by the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult recently, and I think it's still available on their website. Um, and that was talking about uh, monitoring for uh, subsea power cables, which may be of interest, and that actually um, encouraged and incentivized us to uh, produce this webinar as well. This is one of a series that we're running almost every month at the moment. Uh, for example, if you look on our website, you'll see there's another one lined up uh, for next month talking about how our core technology platform works. But this one's going to be about cable fault detection and how our technology is ideally suited uh, to do multi-zone and wide area protection enhancement schemes, which are very appropriate for managing uh, underground uh, cables in transmission and distribution networks. So um, today what we're going to do um, is take you through how our technology works and what the application benefits are. Um, again, if you have questions or anything's not clear to you, please use that Q&A button. Um, the actual presentation should take about 15 to 20 minutes and it's going to be delivered by Dr. Neil Gordon, who's our head of sensor technology here and leads the engineering team who actually uh, design and construct these systems. It may well be that several of you ask similar questions and if you know a question keeps coming up regularly, uh, we'll check back with you at the end and see if we can read any of those back to you uh, because it probably means we didn't explain ourselves very really well and we need to go over something again uh, if there's a consistent question. So we'll try and handle that. Um, otherwise, do please remember that this is one of a series of webinars. So um, do have a look at uh, our website under the events heading where you'll see the list of future ones. And uh, as you wish for this, you'll be kept in touch by us through things like LinkedIn and our email newsletter updates. So um, I think that's probably enough stalling and enough of you are joining and the number's not going up anymore. So I'll stop myself there. And I'd like to introduce you to Neil, who's going to uh, take you through uh, how Synaptic handles cable fault detection, and then we'll talk to you at the end uh, to summarize everything and go back over those questions. Thank you. Over to you, Neil. Okay, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so as Saul has said, my name is Neil Gordon. I'm the head of sensor technologies at Synaptic. And I'm gonna take you through uh, some information on how our unique optical instrumentation technology can be used for cable fault detection. Uh, so the product that we use for this is called Rephase. So I'll be beginning with just a brief background to what the company works on generally and then I'll talk you through uh, in more detail how this how this system works. So Synaptic is a, an SME based in Glasgow in the UK. Uh, we've been around for about five years but we've made quite uh, significant strides into the transmission distribution and offshore uh, sectors since then. 
Um, what we've done is we've developed the world's first distributed electrical sensor networks for modern, medium and high voltage power systems. Um, in practice, what that means is that we've developed small footprint and completely passive optical point sensors for voltage and for current. Um, the way these are installed, just in brief, is that they are spliced in series into the existing fibre network in a power system at any location of interest over a very long range. Um, the measurements generated by this series network of sensors is backhauled by leveraging the existing fibre installed in the power network uh, to a central location to give the operator visibility of distributed assets and remote locations with unprecedented range, reliability, speed and price when compared to existing measurement technologies or other novel measurement technologies. Um, because of the long range and highly multiplex nature of these measurements, um, you can create many novel passive sensor arrays using this technology. And we've deployed these over the last five years um, in many different applications with a number of different operators uh, throughout uh, transmission, distribution and offshore wind. So you can see a few of these listed along the bottom here. So in brief, um, we've worked in the UK with the likes of Scottish Power Energy Networks. Uh, we worked with them Fitness Project, the UK's first digital substation. Um, we've also worked with Statnet in Norway uh, to deploy a completely optical centralized bus bar protection scheme. Um, in the UK, we've worked with the offshore renewable energy catapult uh, to produce a proof of concept for monitoring and protection of array cables in offshore wind. Um, this year uh, with SSE, again in the UK, we are deploying a multi-ended circuit protection scheme. Uh, again, completely optical and completely passive single-ended protection scheme. And later this year, we'll be deploying our first scale offshore deployment with Vattenfall uh, in Aberdeen Bay which will be a combination of mechanical monitoring and uh, differential protection of array cables again. So there's clearly a lot of different applications, uh, different novel applications that these sensors can be used for, but one immediate, simple and very clear application is in cable protection or CFD. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. So uh, just to begin with, why would we need a CFD solution? And I'm sure many, if not all of you are aware of this already, but just to go through it in brief. So there is a general industry trend to underground cables, um, whether this be for urban areas or to protect areas of natural beauty in the countryside. So there is a corresponding increase in the numbers of hybrid circuits uh, in particularly transmission and distribution operating networks, uh, which are circuits composed of both overhead and underground sections. Moving sections of the network underground, of course, means that it becomes more difficult to fault find and repair necessarily. So operators need a, um, a robust method of protection and means of uh, protection response for these circuits. The most reliable and efficient of which would be differential protection, uh, in which you sectionalize that hybrid circuit into discrete monitored sections overhead and underground, you treat them separately. And with that in place, this means the operator is informed immediately in the event of a fault, if it has occurred in the overhead or in the underground section of the circuit and allows them and their protection scheme to respond accordingly. So if there's a, an overhead fault, which is generally transient, like a lightning strike, um, the protection scheme can auto reclose onto that circuit after the fault is cleared. However, if it's an underground fault, then in all likelihood, it's more permanent. Uh, it's more uh, significant damage to that circuit and so it could be very dangerous, very risky to auto reclose onto that. So you would want to block that auto reclose in the event of an underground fault. So that's kind of how that scheme works. Now the drawbacks to deploying a uh, differential protection scheme with conventional instrumentation um, Really, to deploy this, you require discrete measurement of current in and out of that protected section, so that underground section. Um, so it quickly becomes prohibitively expensive and complex to do so using traditional instrumentation, uh, because essentially you need to build a substation at any remote measurement location, which then houses the auxiliary power supplies, the digital telecoms and the GPS receivers, which underpin that conventional measurement scheme. If you wanted to go for a more cost effective option, uh, again, with traditional instrumentation, you could use distance protection for that system. So this obviously does not require discrete remote measurements to perform, but by definition will only give you an estimate of the fault location as a distance from the substation where you have your measurements. 
And this can lead to some ambiguity regarding the fault location, you know, whether it's overhead or underground in that circuit. So because of the, the risk of auto reclosing on what might be a permanent underground fault, it would be very risky to operate um, a distance protection scheme for cable fault detection. So for all these reasons, there's a very strong industry need for a technology that enables cost effective differential protection on hybrid or multi-section circuits in a way that is uh, simple, scalable and reliable. And this is something that we've been asked for uh, many times over the last few years by, uh, by customers in these sectors. And we believe that our technology is uniquely capable of fulfilling this need. So to go into a bit more detail as to what, this, uh, what, what our technology does to tackle this need, um, here you can see a representation of a typical hybrid circuit scheme. So we've got a substation uh, represented on the left-hand side, a uh, length of overhead line, and then a remote cable section uh, represented here in the orange color. So to perform cable fault detection, uh, Synaptic's rephase system requires only two different components. The first is the rephase interrogator located in the substation. Uh, this is Synaptic's core IED and is capable of receiving measurements from dozens of passive sensors simultaneously. And importantly, this device that you can see here on the left is the only powered device in the system. Uh, there's no powered devices outside the substation. This is a standard 19 inch rack unit. Um, it's typically installed in or near to the protection and control rack and substation uh, next to the protection relays and other IEDs. The second device that we need is a, a passive current sensor shown here on the right. So we would deploy one of these on each phase at each transition point to enable a complete differential protection of that line. Each one of these sensors consists of an industry standard, uh, so very familiar form factor, split core current transformer, a CT, uh, the secondary of which is then integrated with Synaptic's unique passive optical measurement technology. So the installation requires only mounting of the CT about the cable at the transition platform to that underground section and standard single mode fiber splicing. And both of these processes are very familiar to installers in this sector. Um, so there's no non-standard installation processes required to install this. That's a particularly important point when compared to other optical measurement technologies, which require things like uh, complex, complex or complicated wrapping of unique types of optical fiber about the conductor and additional components to do things like multiplexing. We don't need any of that uh, unusual or ancillary equipment to deploy these measurements. So it's much simpler and faster to install. Um, once you have that scheme installed, uh, the measurements from each of these passive current sensors, which can be up to 100 kilometers away from the substation containing the interrogator, uh, those measurements are backhauled over the existing fiber network. So in this case, for instance, that would be in the OPGW, um, back to the interrogator. The interrogator would then perform the 87L uh, current differential algorithm on each pair of measurements. And then it would block or enable auto reclose of the protection scheme based on whether a fault has been detected in that monitored section or outside that underground section. Optionally, we can also make available high resolution sampled value measurements from all sensors uh, to the operator. These would all be time stamped uh, with respect to GPS. And it's also important to note that if for any reason there's a loss of time synchronization in the substation, if the GPS receiver is malfunctioning for any reason, all the measurements performed by the interrogator remain in relative sync. So the, the monitoring scheme is not compromised. It still operates fully at that point. So it's very robust in that regard. So I'll go on to drill in a little bit deeper into the sensor technology next. Um, so as I've mentioned, these sensors are completely passive due to the integration of Synaptic's unique and patent protected optical measurement technology. Um, in contrast to other fiber technologies that you might have come across, um, we use an industry standard device, this standard CT, to perform the primary conversion. So it's a standard split core CT for simple retrofit to existing circuits. And again, that would be clamped around the cable at the transition point. Um, our, our technology is then integrated into that CT really to convert the secondary current into an analog optical signal. Uh, the fiber that's used uh, in and out of this device that you can see on the right hand side here. Um, that fiber is just standard single mode fiber. So it's very quick and simple to directly splice into the existing fiber network at the local splice box, which will be located at that transition point. 
in the fiber, it's worth mentioning that the measurements are encoded in the wavelength of the light. So that's effectively the color of the light that's measured. Um, the wavelength is very robust to uh, displacement or routing of the fiber and to electromagnetic interference. Um, it's very difficult to change the wavelength once it's encoded in the fiber. So it's insensitive really to, to routing and looping of the fiber and to any EMI. Um, again, that's by contrast with other optical measurement technologies which have to use things like polarimetric measurements. Um, they're really concerned with the polarization of light in the fiber which can be perturbed by the routing of the fiber and by interference. So we're robust to those effects. All of which is to say that each one of these sensors is very safe, quick and simple to install because uh, each component is very familiar to installers in the industry. Because each sensor is passive as well, uh, there's no civil works required for that installation. As I've said, you don't need auxiliary power supplies, active telecoms or GPS uh, outside the substation. Again, the only powered unit in the scheme is that interrogator located in the substation. Um, each sensor has a, a very wide operating temperature range. Uh, this is because as well as passively measuring the current at its installation location, each sensor will also passively tell us its own temperature. And that allows us to actively compensate for any temperature changes in the data that's generated by the interrogator. And each sensor is compliant with the protection class uh, international standard over that full operating range. Um, secondly, it's worth noting that our sensor technology is uniquely scalable among power systems instrumentation. So we can perform up to 50 measurements on a single fiber up to a nominal maximum distance of 100 kilometers from the interrogator IED. Um, with that fiber, you know, if there's no spare fiber available in your network, uh, we can actually share fiber bandwidth with comms traffic for SCADA purposes or even with other distributed measurement technologies like DAS or DTS, that's distributed temperature or distributed acoustic sensing, which you may have heard of before. So all of this scalability and the ability to operate alongside uh, other schemes means that really we can instrument multiple cable sections or circuits with a single system and ensuring that we have optimum efficiency of measurement at scale. Now, to go into a little bit more detail about what these full schemes look like, um, there's really two standard deployment methods to monitor a single uh, underground section using rephase. So this would be the earth overcurrent or the current differential method. So in the first case, uh, this is a much kind of simpler method in which we would use one or three passive current sensors to instrument the cable sheath of that underground section on a combined or per phase basis. So that further reduces the infrastructure required to detect cable fault. Uh, it doesn't give you that full differential measurement, but it gives you a, a simple and robust method of, de of detecting a cable fault. And in that case, we'd use the ANSI 50G algorithm to uh, we deploy that in the interrogator to detect that cable fault and then inform that auto reclose functionality. In the second case, which I focused on uh, mostly so far in the slides, each transition point of the cable section is instrumented with passive current sensors. So either phase, uh, well, each one of the phases in and out of that section would have a passive current sensor. So this gives you that robust and complete differential current monitoring of the whole section. Uh, and again, we make use of that 87L uh, standard to block or enable auto reclose of the operator's protection scheme. The choice of one or other of these methods is really up to the, uh, to the operator. Um, the important thing is that we can provide either or both in a single scheme. It's worth seeing as well that to deploy one or other of these systems really would only use a small portion of the total sensor budget available to each rephase scheme. As I've mentioned before, that's 50 sensors per fiber over 100 kilometers of distance. So the system's really got market leading scalability, um, which would allow multiple series or parallel cable sections to be instrumented with a single system. Uh, which we think renders this reface system uniquely cost effective at scale. So to probe into that in a bit more detail, uh, given this full budget of 50 sensors per fiber over 100 kilometers, we can provide full differential current monitoring of up to eight cable sections, or even more if we use that to kind of reduce that simpler earth overcurrent method. And these can be distributed really in any configuration provided that the fiber is there to support it. So multiple cable dips in series or multiple lines containing cables in parallel. So this would mean that one single uh, system, so one single interrogator, 
uh, could be capable of monitoring many feeders entering or leaving a substation. Um, so if you've got the situation where you've got multiple feeders exiting a substation uh, underground, for instance, then we can monitor the local end of that underground section and the remote end as well. And if there are any further cable dips some distance remotely outside the substation, we can monitor those as well. Um, it's worth mentioning here that because our unique instrumentation technology is secondary connected to a standard uh, CT, standard current transformer, we can also retrofit to existing CTs that are located in the substation if you have them. So you can imagine if we have a cable leaving the substation, we could secondary connect to an existing CT and then add in our own primary connected remote CT to form that full protection scheme. So hopefully this demonstrates the scalability of this system, which as far as we're aware is unmatched by any other instrumentation technology in the power sector. So that's all been a very, uh, very quick kind of whistle stop tour of what we can achieve, but I'll just summarize the, the pertinent points here. So our market leading scalability allows us to perform very robust differential current monitoring on up to eight cable sections simultaneously or if we perform that much simpler earth overcurrent monitoring uh, in a single ended configuration, which at its simplest would require only one uh, passive current sensor per cable section, we could monitor many, many more cable sections than that with one system. Uh, and indeed combinations of these two approaches are possible within a single deployment. Um, because these sensors use industry standard components in a unique way, there are no non-standard processes involved in the installation. So the devices are of a uh, form factor that's very familiar to installers uh, and we use standard single mode fiber. So this gives you repeatable, reliable and quick installation at remote locations. Um, our unique and patented optical sensing solution ensures stable performance over a wide operating temperature range. Um, as I showed you before, that's as standard, that's minus 40 to plus 80 degrees, but of course we can go wider than that um, should a custom need be there. And all the sensors are qualified to protection class standards and generally are well suited to deployment in these remote environments. And finally, uh, the interrogator IED provides support, of course, for both traditional analog AR blocking, so the dry contact, and digital comm standards for uh, digital control and digital measurements according to the IEC 61850 or the 6189 standard. So both that analog and digital support is available right out of the box. So uh, really it's future-proofed for the future rollout of more digital substations and process bus technologies. So that's really everything I've got to say. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I know that was very brief, but hopefully that gave you a good overview of what we can achieve with this system. Uh, I'd just like now to hand over to my colleague Lloyd Claiborne, who's uh, one of our applications engineers, and he can talk about any of the questions that have come up during this session. Thanks, Neil. Um, we've not had too many questions yet, so we'll just uh, stick around for 10 minutes and I will be here to answer, answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, possibly then we should hand back to Sal just to make some closing remarks. Thank you, Neil. Yes. Um, if you would quickly click onto the last slide there, we'll also put up some uh, information here for everyone. Uh, so that you can quickly note down how you might want to get in touch. It does happen sometimes in these webinars that we've either dazzled you and confused you with what we can do, uh, shocked you into silence, or um, the questions that you need to ask aren't appropriate for a public forum. So uh, that's often the case, and people will want to talk to us more discreetly about specific needs that they've got in their business or challenges they've got with the instrumentation of either you know multiple underground uh, cable networks or you know remote and inaccessible locations where power cables uh, require better instrumentation and visibility so in that case uh, we wanted to make you aware that um, for inquiries that relate to transmission uh, networks um, Gordon Lindsay um, is the chap to go to who looks after our customers in the transmission space equally Tom Morley um, is a business development lead for everything that connects to distribution and or renewable generation. Um, general inquiries, you can email us at sales at Synaptic um, and note that the dot is between the T and the E, so it's not synaptic.com, it's synapt.ec. Um, equally, we've got connections here for you to keep in touch with us and follow what we're doing on our LinkedIn page. Um, 
most of you who've registered for this have given consent for us to be able to keep in touch and we'll supply you with regular news letters and updates here. Uh, but of course, a summary of everything you see here um, is also on our website. So when you go to Synaptec, you'll see, um, uh, we can click on this link directly, but you'll see under our application notes and resources, uh, we've provided some information here about how this cable fault detection technology actually works. And I think that would be uh, quite a useful bit of a uh, uh, backup experience to understand uh, where we are on this. Um, so having said that, of course, um, as is always typical, um, we've prompted some questions and some answers which are uh, which are appearing on, on in the background there. Um, I think uh, it might be worth because we've got a couple of minutes spare time and we're sort of comfortably within budget if people want to keep listening in. Um, maybe Lloyd and Neil, you can uh, respond to the uh, uh, questions about um, the differential uh, protection algorithms that we're using and explaining how we handle different uh, voltage levels. Uh, yes, of course, happy to. Um, so I can see there's a query in here about what kind of line differential protection that we use um, and what kind of voltage levels we have worked up to. So uh, just to go back through some of these slides, so the uh, the standard that we work to is the 87L differential current standard. Um, and in terms of the voltage levels that we work up to, uh, so really the device that, so our optical measurement device is a low voltage device, but it will interface with any standard CT or VT. So we can operate over any standard transmission and distribution voltage range uh, with those devices. So we've installed in different sorts of, of environments. So for instance, uh, as we've shown in this presentation, we've installed about insulated cables where you don't need to have a stand-up insulator. Uh, but we also work with partners to deploy, um, for instance, on bus bars, we can have a, uh, say a 132 kV standoff insulator with a voltage divider or a CT on top. And we've deployed in all those environments as well. So anywhere from the very low up to the very high voltage we can deploy at. And really our sensor technology is agnostic to that voltage level. So hopefully that answers that question. Right, while you were speaking there, uh, Neil, there were a few more uh, coming in there. So mm -hmm. it would be useful if you could, uh, uh, one of them at the beginning I should probably address myself, which was about uh, sites that we've installed these devices on. Um, so I think we probably touched on this at the beginning, but it might have passed people by. Um, so these systems have actually been trialled and are still successfully running uh, in digital substation trials uh, in the UK and in Norway. That's with Scottish Power Energy Networks uh, here in Scotland on behalf of all of the UK operators. Um, that's the Fitness NIC programme. Uh, and also um, uh, in Norway with Statnet, um, these are trials to show how you could use different technologies or our technology to do the centralized bus bar protection schemes. Um, uh, the most recent one with Scottish, uh, sorry, SSE networks uh, is about uh, reaching much further range. Both of those, of course, are about instrumenting many locations that are, you know, densely packed together within the substation yard, you know, bays and feeders running off of a bus bar. Whereas uh, the SSC one that we're in the middle of at the moment is about reaching out, I think, in jumps of 20 and then 30 kilometers away uh, to measure different ends of uh, multiple feeders, which are created by new grid connections. Uh, but all of these are examples of multi-zone uh, protection schemes over wide areas where we're effectively you know, chopping up um, like a linear asset uh, there into different protected sections so that you've got more precise and accurate response to any fault that occurs. Um, so they are out there all in transmission levels. Uh, these are, I think, variously from 275 up to 300 kV from the top of my head. Apologies if I got that slightly wrong, but it is at uh, transmission levels. Uh, and uh, I don't want to speak um, too glibly about this, uh, but in terms of um, feedback we've had on performance, uh, of course, they've all been tested. We go through FATs and then uh, commissioning and, and the ongoing trials. Uh, uh, I don't think we've had any problems. And uh, as far as I'm aware, all of our systems reported back working perfectly uh, in all of those scenarios. Uh, that said, I know there's some more question here about um, uh, 
cost of installation um, and how a plant needs to be out of service for retrofit works. That Neil, it might be good if you could um, tackle those two and talk about what it takes to do installation and commissioning, uh, and possibly you know what what experience we've got of things like retrofitting and scheduling outages to do this and the time taken would probably be useful to share. Yes, of course. Um, so in terms of installation, Synaptic doesn't perform the installation ourselves, um, as I've mentioned uh, probably to death <laughs> in the slides. Um, because they're very standard components, it's very simple for the operator's own installation engineers, their own preferred installers, uh, to install these devices. So we just make ourselves available to advise on that process if necessary. In terms of the time that it takes, it's very quick indeed, again, because we don't need all this supporting infrastructure to install these devices. Uh, each one of those sensors is really just mounting a standard split core CT and two optical fiber splices. So to install a full um, CFD solution, like we've talked about on a single cable section, you would typically expect that to take of order one or two days, really depending on the, uh, the philosophy of the operator around permissions and site access and things like that. Um, but generally it's a very quick process. It would require um, an outage to install, but once that outage is in place, it's a very quick process. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, I see there's another one here about has this equipment been type registered for use on UK national grid networks. Um, so that is something that we're kind of going through that process of doing at the moment. Um, many of the, the kind of trial installations that Saul has spoken about have either concluded already or are on their way to conclusion. So we're now at the stage where we are registering for, uh, we're doing that type registration for use on UK national grid networks. So I'd say if, if you've got an application that you'd like to talk to us about, then please do get in, in touch with one of the uh, with one of our colleagues, as mentioned on the final slide here. Um, I can see there's another question here as well about have we got any field experience at 132 kV uh, is something that we have developed. Um, so uh, as I've said before, we, we do work with partners to provide the kind of insulation requirements for that voltage level. And we can work with really any standard transmission or distribution voltage level. So anywhere down from very low voltage or insulated cables up to, you know, 400 kV plus, we can do that whole range. So 132 is comfortably within that range. Thanks, so I would Neil. say if you've got any... Uh, sorry, so I was just going to say if, if there's any particular applications regarding that, um, that installation at 132 kV, then please do get in, in touch with one of our... Uh, colleagues from this slide you can see in front of you and explore that in more detail. Yeah, uh, in fact, Neil, thank you. I was I was about to suggest that for that particular inquiry, it sounds like there's a particular application there for a rather short cable section. Um, we're familiar with the concept where it's running, you know, into GIS, and certainly we can help with that. We've actually quoted on similar business before, uh, where you've got short cable runs. Uh, although at higher voltage that was going into a you know substation and then going across to the GIS so uh, familiar territory I think we'll, we should deal with that one directly and we'll follow up with you uh, personally so thank you for letting us know that there's an interest there and we're certainly very glad to discuss that with you and propose ways that we could uh, instrument one of those systems and explain what it takes um, and, and what it costs. Uh, of course one of the important points to mention here is that uh, it's very difficult at this stage in an open forum like this to give out guidance on you know what the pricing is and the cost because frankly the number of sensors that are deployed per system uh, makes the cost per location a lot smaller it actually gets effectively cheaper per location the more locations you want to instrument so uh, we want to be sensitive to that and of course if it involves voltages and voltage dividers as well it can have a significant impact on the cost of the system because of the insulators that are required for the job so uh, unfortunately it's very difficult to give ge generic guidance because there are just too many factors and variables however um good idea to follow up on that one directly now i think um that's probably uh, it for the open questions. I can see that looks like it's answered those. So hopefully you've got this information here on your screens. And with that, um, I would just like to thank everyone for dialing in and listening uh, for the last 25 minutes. I hope you found that useful. And um, please remember that uh, it would be useful to keep in touch with us because we've got follow-up sessions coming up um, over the coming months that talk about other applications of this technology and also uh, you know how the system works is the next one 
uh, we go into more detail about how we actually uh, make our photonic sensors and how we made them passive. Um, so if more detail is required, we'll be happily uh, talking to you about that next time around. Otherwise, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you all soon and following up on any inquiries. Thanks and have a great day, everybody.